Everyone's quiet. Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Good evening, and welcome to Blueford Library. My name is Vicki Coleman, and I'm the Dean of Library Services here at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Thank you so much for coming out this evening, and uh, it, it's wonderful having you here, and we have a wonderful program planned for you. This event is made possible by the National Book Foundation, and the event is named History As She Said. The featured author is Dr. Erica Armstrong, Armstrong Dunbar. Before we move into the program, I would like to quickly thank a few individuals for making this program possible. First, if you'll look at the back of the program cards that I gave you, I would like to thank all of the event sponsors. I won't read their names out loud, but uh, please do take, take a look to see what programs on campus here are helping to sponsor this event. I'd like to thank all of the Blueford Library personnel who have worked so dil diligently with me to help plan this evening. I'd like to thank Carrie Sound, who is handling the Facebook stream for this event. I'd like to thank Dr. Alwyn Smallwood, our moderator, who you will see shortly. I'd like to thank Dr. Erica Armstrong, Armstrong Dunbar, our featured author. And I'd also like to thank Ms. Whitney Hugh, the Director of Public Programs for the National Book Foundation. I will now turn the podium over to Ms. Whitney Hugh. Thank you. Hello, good evening. So my name is Whitney Hu, and I'm the Director of Public Programs for the National Book Foundation. Uh, we're extremely grateful to be here tonight and see that our friends down in Greensboro are safe after Hurricane Florence and Michael. Um, we'd also especially like to thank North Carolina A&T State University for hosting us, and of course especially to Vicki Coleman uh, for her gracious hospitality and to responding to all my many, many emails. Um, so we're here tonight as a part of the National Book Foundation's NBF Presents program. In many cases, the foundation is best known for the National Book Awards, our biggest event, uh, but our mission is to celebrate the best literature in America, expand its audience, and ensure that books have a prominent place in American culture, which means that we, do, uh, we have to do a lot more than just host an awards show. And the reason that we have the mission that we do is that we believe, uh, we believe that every community should have access to great literature. So with NBF Presents, we're kicking off a three-year-long stint of partnering with universities, community colleges, libraries, festivals, all around the country, and we're bringing our entire National Book Award author family with us, which means we're going coast to coast, top to bottom, like a giant NBF family road trip. North Carolina A&T State University is the first college we've partnered with underneath MBF Presents. So, yeah. So thank you for being here. Uh, now for tonight's program, we did intend to have both Erica Armstrong Dunbar and Patricia Bell Scott in conversation together. Uh, Pat Patricia sadly suffered an injury that made it difficult for her to travel. She'll be okay, um, but was not able to be here with us tonight. Instead, we'll be switching up the format, and Erica will be giving us a solo talk before she goes into, into a conversation with our moderator, Arwen Smallwood. So without further ado, I'll introduce Erica and Ar Arwen and let them take to the stage. Erica Armstrong Dunbar is a 2017 National Book Award nonfiction finalist for her book, Never Caught, The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of Their Runaway Slave, Ona Judge. She is the Charles and Mary Beard Professor of History at Rutgers University. Her publications, teaching, and documentary appearances have placed her among a small number of African-American women scholars who study black life culture and gender up to the Civil War. Dunbar received her bachelor's from the University of Pennsylvania, where she majored in history and African American studies, and her PhD in history from Columbia University. Her first book, A Fragile Freedom, African American Women and Emancipation in the Adam Benham Silly, was published by Yale University in 2008, and it is widely used in college and graduate classrooms across the country. Her newest book, Never Caught, The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of the Runaway Slave Ona Judge, is a startling, startling and eye-opening look into America's first family, 
Never Caught is the powerful narrative of Ona Judge, George and Martha Washington's runaway slave, who risked it all to escape the nation's capital and reach freedom. She serves on the editorial board for the Race in the Atlantic World Series and was selected as a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians. From 2011 and 2018, she made history by becoming the inaugural director of the program in in African American history at the Library Company of Philadelphia, the nation's first library and one of its oldest cultural institutions. She'll be in conversation later this evening with Dr. Arwen D. Smallwood, who is professor and chair of the Department of History and Political Science at North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University in Greensboro. He is also currently a North Carolina Humanities Council Road Scholar. He's the author of several books, including The Atlas of African American History and Politics, From the Slave Trade to Modern Times, and Birdie County and Eastern North Carolina History. Uh, please help me in welcoming Erica to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Good evening everyone. Good evening. Thank you all for, uh, for coming out to join us. I have, um, first let me thank Dean Coleman for uh, a lovely uh, time that I've been here so far at North Carolina a t State University. I've, I've spent um, the past year and a half sort of moving around the country uh, and talking about this book. And what I realized when the National Book Foundation reached out to me to ask if I would come and give a talk, I realized that um, this is actually the first HBCU where I've been invited to come and give a talk. So you all are the first. <clears throat> and I am happy about that and hope that I have an opportunity to visit uh, other similar institutions because the work that you all do here is so very important. So I'm so happy that I have a chance to, to share my work um, with all of you. And I've had a great time in North Carolina over the, I know you all have been, you know, it's been a rough, what, week or so with power outages and, and what have you. So I'll ask you all to keep the faith uh, and to remember, you know, when things seem difficult um, to think about the ancestors uh, and to think about their experiences. So sometimes we're inconvenienced with no Wi-Fi or electricity, um, but those are sort of momentary uh, problems that will work themselves out. So hang in there. Um, so um, tonight what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about the book, and um, I'm actually I'll read from the book for a little bit too, uh, and then we'll have a chance to have a great conversation and bring you all into the conversation as well. I'm happy to see so many students here. So I hope you're getting your extra credit points or whatever it is that you know you all are promised uh, for showing up. I appreciate faculty who send students to talks uh, and to students who show up. So 41 years ago in January, ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, made history. My generation and those older than I remember the broadcast of the television miniseries Roots, the saga of an American family based on Alex Haley's novel Roots. It aired in 1977 and was seen by over 100 million viewers. It was one of the most watched television broadcasts and it won nine Emmy Awards, most of black Hollywood appeared in Roots. And for families such as mine, the miniseries became really a broadcast event. I was in first grade when Roots first aired, so you all can do the math and figure out how old I am. Uh, and my parents believed that my sister and I should watch every night of the miniseries. And it was long. It was like about eight nights or something like that. It was, it was long, and I was in first grade. Um, and I just remember sort of carefully spreading our blankets on the ground to watch uh, what was a, a family show. We were going to watch it together as a family. We watched a young Kunta Kinte endure kidnapping and beatings and the degradation of the auction block. And viewers were introduced to characters who, although trapped in the unimaginable violence of American slavery, managed to find and maintain 
dignity. And it wasn't until I was much older that I understood the importance of roots to American families, especially to black families. My parents and most of black America wanted desperately to climb out of television's black history famine. Now, shortly after its premiere, Roots was plagued with controversy regarding the sort of authenticity of Haley's research and scholarship. But for families like mine, we held fast to the importance of the miniseries. We had no alternatives. Many criticized what they saw as sort of romanticized relationships that appeared in Roots, but it didn't matter to us. We were grateful. Grateful to see our history find its way finally to prime time television. Grateful that the stories of the enslaved were available to a larger audience. Grateful that Kunta Kinte had become a household name. And I had no idea that this moment in 1977 would help sort of shape my professional trajectory, my career. When I think about what prompted me to become an historian and a writer, I think about the power of roots. It would eventually help me define my passion for writing the histories of the enslaved and for telling these stories and giving this story, this information to large publics. So some time ago, maybe about 15 or so years ago, I was completing some work on my first book. And my first book was about how black women became free in the North. And I'd done a lot of reading about sort of slavery in the South and how people were uh, fighting to become free. But I thought, okay, well, what was happening in the North? We know that slavery existed in the North. So I, I was working on this book. And I was doing what kind of, you know, nerdy historians do. I was in the archives, one of the best places, libraries. Um, and I was looking through old newspapers. That's the best way to sort of figure out what, what's everyday life like at the moment that you're researching. So for the students in the room who are doing, working on research papers, old newspapers, a great primary source. So I'm sitting there uh, looking at microfilm because, of course, this was before the age of anything being digitized. And I'm looking at the microfilm and reading through a newspaper dated May of 1796. And it was a newspaper in Philadelphia. And up popped an advertisement. And it was a runaway slave advertisement. I thought, OK, well, that's kind of odd. This is the 1790s in Philadelphia. Slavery is almost gone. Who's advertising for a runaway slave in a place where slavery is almost dead? And so the language sort of jumped out at me, and it said, absconded from the household of the President of the United States. And I thought, wait a minute. So I look at the date, 1796, doing the math. Okay, that's George Washington. Who was running away from George Washington? And George Washington brought his slaves to Philadelphia. And so at that moment, I was intrigued. And the runaway slave advertisement went on to describe her to name her, and the advertisement named her as Oni Judge, O-N-E-Y. And I argue that Oni is the kind of diminutive, the nickname that the Washingtons used uh, for her. I call her by the name that she went by at the end of her life, which was Ona, Ona Judge. So as a marker of adult dignity, I name her, I call her Ona. So I'm reading this advertisement, and all of a sudden, I'm immediately sort of excited and intrigued, and I'm like, mm, this is going to be the next book project. And I'm, remember, I'm still working on the first book. And I was like, maybe I can find a way to put it in book one. And I said, no, this needs its own treatment. So at the moment that I'm excited and um, sort of looking forward to learning more about her, I'm also frustrated, and I'm also sort of angry, to be honest. Here I am, a supposed expert in African-American women's history, and I don't know this story. What's wrong with that? Why don't I know this woman's name? Why don't I know this story? Why don't I know the story about the Washingtons and their relationship with slavery? And so this really began what ended up becoming a nine-year journey in uncovering information 
about one of the most incredible women I've ever met in the archives, um, Ona Judge. So what I'll ask you to do is to walk with me uh, into the 18th century to spend a little time, and as I said before, I'll, I'll try to read a little bit as well. <clears throat> Spring rain drenched the streets of Philadelphia in 1796. Weather in the city of brotherly love was often fickle at this time of year, vacillating between extreme cold and oppressive heat. But rain was almost always appreciated in the nation's capital. It erased the putrid smells of rotting food, of animal waste and filth that permeated the cobblestone roads of the new nation. Spring rain cleansed the streets and souls of Philadelphians. It brought hope. It brought optimism. It brought a feeling of rebirth. But in the midst of the promises of spring, Ona Judge, a young enslaved woman, received devastating news. She learned that she was to leave Philadelphia, a city that had become her home. Judge was to travel back to her birthplace of Virginia and prepare herself to be given away as a wedding gift to her owner's granddaughter. Tonight I'll introduce one of the most understudied fugitive slaves in America. At the age of 22, Judge literally stole herself from George and Martha Washington forcing the president to show his slave-catching hand. As a fugitive, judge tested the president's will and his reputation. The most important man in the nation, heralded with winning the American Revolution, could not seem to reclaim his enslaved woman. Ona Judge did what very few people had done before her. She beat the president. She was never caught. And so I'll talk, just I always sort of talk a little bit about um, the title of the book. I always worked with this working title of Never Caught. And so I eventually, I turned in the final manuscript, and y'all know it took, took me nine years to sort of research, write, and eventually publish this book. And so I finished the manuscript. My editor's okay with it. We turn it in. She's okay with the title. And then I get the call. I get the call from marketing. And marketing says, Erica, we, we don't like the title of your book. And I was like, we, you know, I've been working with this title for many years now. Uh, what's the problem? And they said, well, you're giving the story away. And I, I sort of stopped for a moment and I thought, well, okay, well, we have other examples of books, of plays, of narratives where we have a similar situation, 12 years a slave, he's going to be a slave 12 years. We don't know what's going to happen at the end one way or the other, but we know he's going to be a slave for 12 years. Death of a salesman, you know what's going to happen in the end, right? But what they really wanted, you know, I was, it was suggested that I use terms like free or freedom in the title, and I refused to do that. Because in reality, owner was never free. She would live as a fugitive for the entirety of her life, an additional half a century after she would leave the Washingtons. And I thought it was really important to make certain that we didn't confuse the status of her not being caught with being a free person. So, we, uh, so I won that battle, yeah. Yeah. kept the title. Uh, and then we have, of course, uh, the Washingtons' relentless pursuit of her, which I'll talk about about uh, momentarily. So this is uh, an image of Mount Vernon. How many of you have actually visited Mount Vernon? A few. Um, it's, uh, this was the estate of George and Martha Washington. This is actually a picture from, uh, an image from much later, uh, be after Ona's um, death, but it's a, a sort of decent image. This is actually the back of the mansion house at Mount Vernon. And so if you're sitting on that porch, they have sort of nicely lined rockers there now if you go to visit. You look out onto the Potomac River. 
It's a beautiful site. And this is the space, the place in which Ona was born and where she was born into slavery and would live as an enslaved child uh, for the first part of her life. Tonight, I argue, I introduce a new American hero. An enslaved girl raised at Mount Vernon who once exposed to freedom was compelled to pursue it at any cost. This was a woman who found the courage to defy the President of the United States, the wit to find allies, to outnegotiate, to run, and to survive. Her story is the only account we have of a fugitive once held by the Washingtons. Right? So she, Ona gives us two interviews at the end of her life where she tells us about her experience as an enslaved person living with the first president of the United States. We also believe it might be the only testimony we have at this point of a fugitive uh, from any fugitive, really, from 18th century Virginia. Judge's life exposes the sting of slavery and the drive of defiance. She guarded what she called her freedom every day of her life, never regretting her decision to fight for what she believed to be her right, and that was the right to be a free person. So Ona's born in 1773-74. We don't have an exact birth date. The Washingtons did not keep uh, records of the birth dates of the enslaved. But from corroborating evidence, we've placed it around 1773-74, the beginning of the America, the era of the American Revolution. She was born to an enslaved woman named Betty. Betty was a seamstress and a spinner. She was actually owned technically by Martha Washington. She was what was called a dower slave. So George didn't technically own Betty, but he was in charge of Martha Washington's estate. When, uh, just so we all remember, uh, Martha was married once before George Washington, right? So she was widowed. Um, and when she was widowed, she was left with a tremendous amount of property and wealth. She became one of the wealthiest women in the Chesapeake. So when George Washington and Martha Washington, uh, Martha Park Dandridge Park Custis eventually marry, um, George Washington becomes, as my grandmother would have said, you know, he came up in the marriage. Like he married into some money. Uh, because he, while he was a slave owner and had some wealth, Martha was the larger slaveholder of the two. Betty was Martha's slave. Ona Judge's father was a man named Andrew Judge. And Andrew Judge was a white indentured servant. Uh, George Washington had purchased his agreement in Baltimore about a year or so before, 1772. He was a tailor. Betty was a seamstress. I don't know the nature of their relationship. I don't know if it was consensual. I don't know if it was the opposite of consensual. What I know is that at some moment in 1773 or 74, Ona was born. She's the only person on the roster of the enslaved or who's noted by uh, the Washingtons with the surname of Judge. And with the description given ab about her, uh, we know that she's mixed race, right? And Andrew Judge is the only person out Mount Vernon with the last name of Judge. He's the only person in all of Fairfax County with the last name of Judge. So it's fair to say that Andrew Judge was her father. At the age of 10, Ona was called up to work at the mansion house. She was to follow in the footsteps of her mother to become a seamstress and a spinner. And at some point during what we would call now her teenage years, she becomes Martha Washington's chosen one. She becomes her chosen slave, top slave, if you will. And what that means is that she was responsible for the most intimate of responsibilities for Martha. It meant she helped her bathe. She brushed her hair. She made her clothing. She took care of her clothing. She was there to take care of Martha, to be present but not be seen. This responsibility became more involved in 1789 when George Washington was elected president 
of the United States. When he was elected president, the Washingtons were forced to move to New York, the site of the nation's first capital. And in this move, the Washingtons decided that they would bring a little bit of home with them to New York. That is, they brought some of their slaves. They would bring seven enslaved people to New York, five men, two women. Ona was one of them. And I'm going to read briefly um, from the book about this moment that Ona is forced to leave her family, to leave Mount Vernon and all that she knew. The young Ona judge was far from an experienced traveler. The teenager knew only Mount Vernon and its surroundings and had never traveled far from her family and loved ones. For judge, the move must have been similar to the dreaded auction block. Although she was not to be sold to a different owner, she was forced to leave her family for an unfamiliar destination hundreds of miles away. Judge would have had no choice but to stifle the terror she felt and to go on about the work of preparing to move, folding linens, packing Martha Washington's dresses, her personal accessories, and helping with the grandchildren were the tasks at hand, and it wasn't her place to complain or question. Judge had to remain strong and steady, if not for herself, then for her mistress who appeared to be falling apart at the seams. Like Judge Martha Washington had no choice about the move to New York. Her life was at the direction of her husband, who was now the most powerful man in the country. Mrs. Washington and Ona Judge may have shared similar concerns, but of course, only Martha Washington was allowed to express discontent and sorrow. Martha was unhappy, and everyone knew it, including her frightened slave. The president's nephew, Robert Lewis, would also soon be made aware of it. When he arrived at the estate on May 14th, things were in disarray. Lewis had served as Washington's secretary between 1789 and 91, and he was chosen to escort his aunt and her grandchildren to New York. But he was surprised and a bit concerned when he arrived to find a frenzied and hectic scene. Lewis wrote, everything appeared to be in confusion. The manifestation of Mrs. Washington's conflicting feelings. Robert Lewis described the departure which finally took place May 16th, 1789 as an emotional moment for the slaves and the first lady. He wrote, after an early dinner and making all necessary arrangements in which we were greatly retarded, it brought us to three o'clock in the afternoon when we left Mount V. The servants of the house and a number of the field Negroes made their appearance to take leave of their mistress. Numbers of these poor wretches seemed greatly agitated much affected, my aunt equally so. Betty, Ona Judge's mother, must have been one of those agitated slaves. Not only was she losing her 16-year-old daughter, but she was also losing her son, Austin, who would serve as one of the waiters for the Washingtons. Austin's wife, Charlotte, and their children would have joined in the morning Betty watched her children leave Mount Vernon, a reminder of what little control enslaved mothers had over the lives of their children. If she found any comfort that day, it would have been that brother and sister were traveling together. Austin was older and male and could look out for his younger sister, but still, Betty knew that her relationship with her children would never be the same. And so this is the moment 
Winona leaves Mount Vernon and everything that she knows as a 16-year-old to travel eventually to New York. Uh, her stay in New York was short. The nation's capital moved to Philadelphia uh, in November of 1790. And so she, uh, along with the Washingtons, eventually move to a new home in Philadelphia. This is actually a lithograph, a sketch from the 1830s of the president's house in Philadelphia. How many of you have actually visited, say, the Liberty Bell in the Philadelphia area? So this house doesn't exist anymore. We have some of the retaining walls intact, but they've tried to sort of uh, restructure to give you an idea of what that house looked like. And I always show this image because I want students in particular to think about what a president's house looks like at the end of the 18th century, right? It's not a... White House or Mar-a-Lago, wherever presidents live these days. This is, by our standards, we'd say a relatively modest home. Those standards, it was larger, but this was a house that was packed with almost 30 people living in this space. There were the Washingtons. They brought their grandchildren, two of them, to live with them. There were servants and secretaries and the wives of their secretaries and, of course, the enslaved. The Washingtons actually brought nine enslaved people over the time that they were in Philadelphia to live with them. Ona was one of them. And it was here in Philadelphia that Judge's life would change course. It was here that Ona saw really black freedom in a way that was palpable. She, saw, she was the oddball by arriving as an enslaved person in Philadelphia. By 1790, there were only a little over 100 enslaved people left in the city. There were 6,000 free blacks living around her. So she came in the minority and would watch and see black freedom around her, black men and women as entrepreneurs, selling their pepper pot soup, selling their fruits and vegetables, Mother Bethel Church literally being built almost within a stone's throw from her. As I said, black freedom was palpable. There was no way to keep that from her. And so during the six years that she lives in Philadelphia, she watches this. And she's maturing at this moment, too, right? She's coming of age. And she's coming of age not on a plantation in Virginia where the majority of black people around her are enslaved. But she's coming of age in a place where the majority of black people are free. And this affects her. February of 1796, the Washingtons receive a letter in the mail, and it was a letter from their granddaughter. So just to sort of remind you, Martha Washington had um, a number of children with her first husband. They actually all die before uh, really becoming adults. One died as an adult uh, in the American Revolution from Camp Fever. So she really only had her grandchildren left. Martha and George Washington never had biological children. George had no biological children that we know of. Um, and so her, she doted on her grandkids. So they received this letter in the mail from one of her granddaughters. And I'll, I show her image um, because I kind of want you to get a feel for who this woman was. Eliza Park Custis Law. She lived in Virginia. She was one of the, of the Washington's older grandchildren. And she sent a letter home saying, I'm getting married. You don't know him. He's 20 years older than I am. And he's a British man. And he spent all this time in India. And he has these biracial Indian children, like total wild card for the Washingtons. It was totally not what they were expecting in terms of uh, someone who would marry their granddaughter. So she sends this letter home asking them to, uh, to basically approve. And so George and Martha are not comfortable, but eventually they write home. George writes back to her and says, yes, if this is what you want, I'm paraphrasing, if this is what you want, uh, we will support it. They didn't go to the wedding, but they supported uh, her decision. And it's this moment that ends up changing Ona's life. I show this picture because Eliza was known for being a sort of difficult woman 
temperamental. This was a, a portrait done by Gilbert Stewart, a well-known artist uh, of the time, who was supposedly painting George Washington. And she was getting annoyed with how long it took, so she sort of burnt, this is the, the folklore around it. She burst through the room, her arms were crossed, and Gilbert Stewart decided to paint her instead. He thought it was interesting, right? So this is the woman who would visit the Washingtons and now was looking for their approval. And Martha understood that she was difficult and sometimes um, erratic, and she felt like she wasn't really prepared for a life of marriage. And there was one thing that she could do to help her, to help her transition to the role of being a wife and a mother. And that would be to give her the very best slave that she had she would give her Ona Judge as a wedding gift. Ona learned at some point that she would be given away and had a decision to make. She knew that if she returned to Virginia to work under Eliza, that she would be doomed to a difficult life. And living in the North, she knew that this was a moment she had to review. While the Washingtons were preparing to leave on a summer trip back to Mount Vernon, Ona was preparing to leave too. She'd later state in an interview at the end of her life, whilst they were packing to go to Virginia, I was packing too. I didn't know where I would go, for I knew that if I went back to Virginia, I should never get my liberty. I had friends among the colored people of Philadelphia, had my things carried there beforehand, and left the Washington's house while they were eating dinner. On Saturday, May 21st, 1796, Judge walked out of the president's house and never returned. So this is an image of that, remember I told you at the beginning of, of our conversation together, this was one of the um, runaway slave advertisements that were placed in, in, there were two Philadelphia newspapers, the Philadelphia Gazette and Claypool's Ameri American Daily Advertiser. So you can note, you see this is May 24th. She runs away on the 21st, which is a Saturday. The Philadelphia Gazette is publishing this runaway slave advertisement on the 23rd, so by Monday, there's basically an APB out um, on Ona. And this language, I don't know if you can see it, just struck me when I first saw it. Absconded from the household of the President of the United States on Saturday afternoon, Oni Judge, a light mulatto girl, much freckled with very black eyes and bushy black hair. She is of middle stature, but slender and delicately made, about 20 years of age. And it goes on to sort of talk about her clothing. And at the bottom paragraph, it says $10 will be paid Paid to any person, white or black, who will bring her home. So, and this is interesting because this sentence appears in the advertisement for a couple days and then it disappears. Clearly, the Washingtons believe that the free black community helped her escape, and they were correct. And this was an attempt to try and have the free black community turn on Ona, which they did not. So, this is the moment when Ona flees. She boards a ship headed for New England, and eventually finds herself in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I'm not going to sort of go into everything that sort of happens at the, once she arrives in New England, in part because some of you haven't read the book. I'm trying not to do the spoiler thing. I want to, you know, spoiler alert. I don't want you, I mean, you know she's never caught. But you don't know what happens once she's there. And if I, you know, I'll remind you that the second half of the title of this book is The Washington's Relentless Pursuit of Their Runaway Slave. Owner runs away in May of 1796. By August, the Washingtons know exactly where she is. She's been spotted, she's been informed upon, and the Washingtons are told. George Washington would literally spend the rest of his life attempting to capture her. George died in December of 1799. In, as late as September, I have documents showing him attempting to get her back, using the power of the presidency, using uh, the secretary of the treasury, a customs collector, his family members, all to try and discreetly 
bring her back, basically breaking his own fugitive slave law of 1793. And he's unsuccessful. But he and Martha Washington basically pursue her until the end of their lives. And even at the end of Martha Washington's life, it did not mean that Ona was in the clear. Her status as a fugitive, as an enslaved person, simply passed her down to the heirs of Martha Washington, to her grandchildren. She was still owned by the Park Custis estate. Ona would spend the next 50 years of her life as a fugitive. And while she hid in the shadows, I'm fairly certain that she never wanted to be forgotten. And so I take great honor um, and pride in sharing her story with audiences such as yourselves. Um, it's an honor, but it's also an obligation to do this kind of recovery work, to rethink the narrative of American history, and to do it through the eyes of enslaved women. So I thank you for spending some time with me. And I think we'll get a chance now to move into conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Again, uh, thank you again for yeah. excellent presentation and for being with us this evening. Again, I want to thank uh, all of the organizers of tonight's event. Um, uh, again, I, I, I think that uh, this is an important topic that we need to discuss. I was listening to your presentation and, you know, I'm thinking of uh, questions to ask, uh, as you said, not to be a spoiler, and you did a <laughs> lot of prep in terms of uh, explaining to people how you came across you know, this particular topic. And then, like uh, most historians, sometimes it's accidental mm -hmm. that you're in the archives, you're looking through documents, and you find something that really kind of captures your attention. And then you pursue that. And so following up on that, I mean, I have the basic questions that most people would ask. And that is, um, how, you know, how did your upbringing influence your going into this profession and, mm. and doing this? Yeah, I was, um, I was fortunate in that I had a, um, an education that really um, exposed me to history. I think growing up in Philadelphia, um, with, you know, you, kinda, you can't escape history. It's all over the place, right? It's the, where the Declaration was signed and the Constitution was created. So it's, you know, we, all, we always say that we're in, like, freedom's backyard, um, at least for some. And so, you know, all those trips to the Liberty Bell and the Constitution, Constitution Hall and those things, I think it rubbed off on me. But ultimately, I liked storytelling. I liked a good story. Um, and I thought that history provided that opportunity, that it was a story with facts, you know, that was evidence-driven. Um, and I think as, as a teenager, I realized, sitting in my classes, that um, I wasn't hearing stories about people who look like me. And so, and that troubled me. And I, I wanted to know why. I remember my, my senior year in high school, we had a big sort of research paper uh, to write, we could choose any topic, and I chose to write on Camp William Penn, which was one of the um, sites of the colored troops from the Civil War right outside of Philadelphia. And so I think even then I understood the need to insert the lives of black people into what we call American history, right, the narrative of American history. And so I think, you know, I... I liked history, but I'll be honest, I went to college, I didn't think I was going to be a professor or a writer. I was going to be a lawyer and make some money, right? That was the plan, at least that's what I thought the plan was. Um, I was still going to major in history, uh, but I had the opportunity to meet some great professors who sort of took me to the side and said, Erica, you know, you may want to think about a career as a professor and to get a PhD in history. And I didn't have anyone in my family who had a PhD. I didn't know you could get a PhD in the humanities. I thought that was like just hard science. And I was like, really, how do you do that? And they taught me how. I did not know. Um, they took a chance. They invested in me. And uh, it became clear that I needed to follow my heart 
and to choose a career that I thought would make me happy for my life, the majority of my life, and that would pay back, that would offer something back. Um, and for me, it was sharing the, writing the history of black people that had not yet been told. Excellent. And that's part of the follow-up question that I have in the sense that, you know, I think many people understand that there were founding fathers that did own slaves and that prior to the revolution, slavery was, you know, universal in the 13 colonies as a part of the British Empire. But, the, you know, but how do you think uh, this story, and I can't say should affect, but how do you think it has affected yeah. people who, you know. You know Thinking who, about founding fathers and. And particularly George Washington. Yeah, you know, I think for a long time, George kind of got a pass on slavery, right? Everybody was focused on Thomas Jefferson and his, like, <laughs> nastiness, right? And, you know, Annette Gordon-Reed comes along with her book, The Hemings of Monticello, it was 2007 or so, and, um, you know, lots of folks were like, no, it couldn't be Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings, and then DNA was like, yeah. Um, <laughs> And, you know, so I think there's, there's been a lot of interest and in, in, in engagement, in part because that's a story about slavery and sex, to be very honest, right? Mm -hmm. um, George Washington, I think, uh, avoided that, in part because um, of the importance of his place in American history, right? Mm -hmm. We're very invested in the myth of George Washington. He's on our dollar bill, you know, can I tell a lie, cherry trees, all that. Um, and wooden false teeth, all of that is not true. Um, we know, yes, he did have false teeth, but we know that they were dentures made from teeth pulled from the skulls of enslaved people. They were not wooden. Um, and so, I think that Washington represents one of the, quote, founding fathers who had shifting ideas about slavery. I think he was just as affected by his time living in the North and meeting other people, and his ideas did shift. Uh, he was born as a slaveholder, basically. He was given slaves as a young, as a young child when his father dies, and he lived um, a life that was based upon slave labor. But he did become uncomfortable with it. And at the end of his life, he made the decision to emancipate his slaves, not Martha's, but to set them free upon the death of Martha. And so I think for that reason, we've said, OK, well, he let his people go. But you know, the point I make is the yes, but he never was willing to do that while he was alive. You know, that that was a decision he made in death. And also, without having biological children, there were no sons or daughters who were looking for an inheritance of over 120 enslaved people. That was a tremendous amount of wealth. So I think there, there are reasons that we haven't thought deeply or focused deeply on Washington and slavery. And what I saw with Ona was that she gave me the opportunity to write a, a biographical book about a, an incredible woman and about her life. But it allowed me also to think about the founding of the nation through the eyes of an enslaved woman, and not from this kind of top-down father, founding father's history, but to really do it through the eyes of the people who built this nation, who literally made the bricks to build what was the federal city that would become Washington, D.C. So Ona, was, her story was great because it let me Think, talk about the Washingtons, both of them, to talk about the founding of the nation, but also to explore her amazing life. And, and that's the other follow-up question, and that is, what does, you know, again, without giving away, you know, the, the story to those who haven't read the book, but um, what does this tell us in terms of offering to the discipline of history in terms of perspective. You know, we, we look at various perspectives, you know, the slave's perspective, the, the, the uh, plantation owner's perspective, you know, the anti-slavery perspective. I mean, what, what, do, what does her story add 
to, to that narrative and to us understanding? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Ona was someone who, part of what makes her story so amazing, besides the fact that she ran away from George Washington and stayed away from him, um, was that she traveled in the 18th, in late 18th, early 19th century. So she moved, she lived, was born in Virginia, lived in New York, lived in Philadelphia, then lived in New England. That was basically all of America at this moment in time. So the fact that she moves and she's in these different spaces allows, her life allows us a lens, a portal into each of these spaces. It allows us to see how a place like New York and Philadelphia were really different even though they were northern cities, we, we enter into these cities through her life seeing that there's still slavery, and a lot of it, in New York at least, and in Philadelphia. And then her sort of travel to New England um, helps us also think about what it means to be a free person at this moment. So what does freedom mean if there's so many other people who are enslaved. If there's the risk of you being kidnapped and dragged into slavery, even if you had never been enslaved yourself, what does freedom mean? What does it mean when over a million enslaved people are living south of Philadelphia and you are a free person? What does your life look like, feel like? And so Ona gives me the opportunity to talk about that experience as well, what it meant to be a fugitive, how difficult it was to be a fugitive, and to constantly be hiding. Very good. Excellent. Is in for for women today? Again, we talk about you know, you know African American women, women in general, but people of color. I mean, what can uh, can women pull from this story, this narrative? Is is there? You know, is there something that, you know, and I'm going to ask you the same question mm -hmm. in terms of how did this, doing this research and writing this book, how did it impact you? And when, in reading this book, do you think uh, women will take away from the book something different than men, or do you think that, you know, everyone should leave with a similar? Yeah, I didn't, you know, I wrote this book for all readers. I think that, um, I hope that men and women take away the same um, sort of thoughts that they read the book and they understand, A, how difficult it was to live in the 18th century period, right? No matter who you were, it was difficult. Right. It was the founding of the, uh, it was a new nation. Um, I want people to understand the nature of labor, mm -hmm. what it meant to be enslaved, what it meant to be free, what it meant to be an enslaved person who worked in the home of one's owner. You know, there's this kind of mythic understanding that, oh, it's better to work in the house if you were an enslaved person as opposed to the fields and it would never caught. I, I ask people to rethink that equation, right? And right. what does it mean that you never are away from your owner? That you are constantly under their watchful eye? That you never have a reprieve? That you don't live in the cabins or the quarters where you have a moment to remove yourself from the unyielding work of slavery in the house. What does it mean to prepare food in the 18th century for your owner's family? What time do you get up in the morning to pluck those chickens and to make that bread? How do you wash their clothing in the 18th century? Where do you fetch the water from? How do you make the soap to wash those clothes? This was all the work that took place in the household, and, and then some, and more. And so I think what I hope is that all readers, regardless of, of gender or background or orientation, that they walk away feeling like they've walked in Ona's shoes, that they understand what it means at this moment, this, the intersection of slavery of, and freedom, of race, of gender, that all of these things come together and influence her experience um, as a black woman in the 18th century, a 19th century. For me, um, how did Ona influence me, I think, was what you sort of asked me. You know, I, I always say, you know, as a historian, I'm not supposed to say these kinds of things. I'm supposed to be real scientific and what have you. But um, I sort of feel like Ona chose me. I don't know that I had much, I don't want to say I didn't have much to do with it. I think she, I think I was in the right place at the right time working on the right scholarship 
to tell this story, right? I'd just been writing about black women who were becoming free in the North. So I knew those stories, and that was crucial because Ona, like many other black women who were enslaved, did not leave behind a tremendous number of documents. So how am I able to do this work, myself and other historians who focus specifically on African-American women, how do we tell their stories with these very incomplete archives, right? Archives that are filled with documents really written by and about white men. How do I tease the story of someone like Ona from a very thin um, set of documents or evidence? And really, it's working on the lives of other people that help you draw um, information and understanding about what Ona's experiences must have been like. Even if I don't have documents to say Ona did this on this day, I know what the experiences of other women, unnamed women, uh, what they were. So for me, this is recovery work, like important recovery work. And if we truly want an American history, a narrative about American history to be one that is inclusive, that includes the lives of people of color, of women, uh, people from all different backgrounds, then we have to change that narrative. And so my hope is that um, Never Caught and Ona's story helps us to do that. And I was going to say also, you know, during your presentation, the title, I think, was, 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 you know, and how you explain why you came to that title and defended that title was very powerful because, again, people needed to understand that, you know, although she was free, she was not free. Right. And that at any time, if someone could identify her, uh, you know, she would be, you know, basically brought back into slavery. And I think that's powerful. I don't think that, you know, like if, if any other title might have might have you know, taken away from that. I think that was very, very good. Uh, and she lent her, you know, I think one of the things that's incredible about Ona is that she knows she's a fugitive, right? She knows that it's against the law to run away. Her owner is the one who signed the first Fugitive Slave Act, which gave slave owners the opportunity, the right to cross state lines, to recover their slaves. But there was a process that had to happen there, right? There was uh, an identification process. There were judges, magistrates, attorneys that had to be involved in the recovering of a slave. And what was very interesting was George Washington didn't want any of that. He wrote that he wanted it to be handled discreetly. He was not interested in lawyers and judges and nope. He used his power of the presidency to try and reclaim her and not follow those rules he set for himself. So this is a moment where we sit back and we see George Washington breaking the law, like his own law that he wrote in order to reclaim her. And so the fact that she still walks and lives as a free person, knowing that she's not, uh, there's a moment when she, she marries and I found her marriage announcement in an old news, in an 18th century newspaper, and she didn't use a pseudonym. She didn't use a fake name. She gave her her name. And, you know, that was a moment where you're like, she is gutsy. Like, she's like, I'm going to live my life and be me. And I know this president's running after me. And what's hilarious is that it appears in a newspaper, the New Hampshire Gazette, and two columns over is a column uh, a, a farewell address that was offered by George Washington to the people of New Hampshire. Uh, so, like, two columns over <laughs> is Ona. It's like, I'm married, then what you gonna do? You know, like, contesting him in print. Of course, she didn't know she was doing this, but you look at it and symbolically you step back and you're like, she was a, a, an enslaved woman, illiterate, who was owned by the Washingtons, the most powerful couple in the nation, and she was still living her life. That, to me, you know, the moments where perhaps the answer to your question about how it affects me is, you know, the moments where we have our, um, you know, temporary discontent uh, or we're unhappy or upset about something, like I said earlier, you know, we think, about the ancestors, and I think about Ona, like all the time. I'm in an airport, I'm delayed, and I start getting annoyed or mad, and I'm like, Erica, chill. Like, people have been through far worse yes. and have been better while they're, while they're going through their difficulties. And so I think in many ways, as I said, Ona's an American hero, mm -hmm. and we can't see her as anything except that. Very good. 
I guess I would say based on, you know, just that commentary is that I think oftentimes we don't realize that there was defiance, you know, that, and it not so much always dramatic defiance in terms of rebellions, although they, they occurred as well, but there were other acts of defiance, and running away was always an act of defiance, but to then, again, you know, publish, you know, that you're getting on with your life, you're getting married, you're having a family, you know, again, it's a, it's a, it's a show of defiance, you know, in, in the face of the system of slavery and the fact that she's being pursued. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, I guess should I now open it up to the audience to see if there are questions from the audience? Let me pause here. Are there any questions from the audience? Anyone? Did Ona ever have any children? So you just want me to give all of it away. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, what so um except for with George Washington. So um how do I do that? <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> I think it's a great question, though, uh, and I'll, I'll answer it this way. Um, I think Ona followed in the footsteps of, you know, the countless other fugitives who found their way across the 18th and 19th century to the north, to those who left the country, fled to Canada or to Mexico later on. Um, they were looking to create family, right? She left behind her family in Virginia. So... It was a priority, I think, for her and for many others to build something new. And I'll leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, go ahead. Brother? Yes. Was he a judge also, or did he have a different surname? So the question was about Austin, um, Ona's brother, who came actually. Austin um, came to Mount Vernon with Betty. He was close to two years in age. So he was significantly older than Ona, and he was born not at Mount Vernon, but at the plantation where he lived with Betty, which was where Martha's first husband lived. So no, they had different, um, different fathers. And, you know, at Mount Vernon, there's, it's suggested that there was another sibling um, who had the last name of Judge. Her first name actually was Philadelphia. And so if you go throughout Mount Vernon, you'll see in some of the um, descriptions and placards about Philadelphia Judge. But I found no evidence, no um, document that says she was actually a judge. Um, so Ona had other siblings, so half, I guess we'd call them half-siblings, we're using that terminology, uh, where they all had the same mother but different fathers. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the back. Right. Yeah, that's a great. So the question is really about Ona's surname and about the nature of the relationship or whatever between Betty and Andrew Judge, her father. Um, you know, I'm very clear about stating that I don't know if it was consensual or if it was rape. This is slavery. This is um, the inability of black women to um, really protect their bodies and their reproductive abilities. I don't know. Uh, but then again, we have instances in which black and white people are having interracial sex in a way that is consensual. So I'm very clear in the book that I can't kind of comment one way or the other. What is exceptional is that um, he must have claimed her because the Washingtons call her Oni Judge. So had Andrew not claimed or admitted to or whatever that this was his child, then she would have been like the almost over 300 other enslaved people by 1799 in Mount Vernon who had no last name. So it suggests something a little more involved and. You know, there are many scenarios that could have played out. Maybe Betty was interested in being with Andrew because she felt like at some point, as a white man, he would be free. He was a servant, but at some point he would serve off, he would serve his indenture agreement, and perhaps he could buy her. Perhaps he could buy her and her children. 
and make her life. And I, we don't know if this was an opportunistic move. We don't know if it was a romantic move. What we know is that uh, Ona Judge was born, and she's the only one at Mount Vernon with that surname. Yes. Yeah. How do, so the question was, how do, I, um, how do I explain this relentless pursuit of, of George Washington? You know, and, and what I always say is that, you know, I believe George Washington was at a point in his life at that moment where he was having some misgivings about slavery. He wrote uh, that he wanted to get quit of his Negroes. That's what he wrote. Um, but he argued that he couldn't do it because, you know, his slaves had intermarried with Martha's slaves and he would be breaking up families. That was the excuse given, right? That he didn't want to break up families. Um, but, you know, we know this is also a story about wealth, right? And about, giving, about living with wealth at a moment in which the nation um, in t financially was completely unstable. Um, I, I believe that... Um, there were several reasons that he pursued her relentlessly. One, and the, probably the, the main reason, was because of Martha. Martha wanted her slave back. And in almost every document where he writes a letter, he would say, oh, and my wife is very desirous of seeing her again. Like, Martha's always inserted into that equation. It's never just George writing to someone trying to get her back. It's always George and, and his wife. And, you know, this was, and they were also angry. And, and George wrote in one of his letters that Ona was raised more like a child than a servant. So, you know, it's, when you read those letters, it's like, well, you know, you don't give your children away as wedding gifts, but okay. <laughs> um, and, you know, and, and that's the moment where you think about the way that uh, slave owners justified their behavior, right, the way and this sort of paternalistic response to, to slavery. And um, so he was angry. But I also believe that Ona was a, a liability in many ways. She lived with the Washingtons day in and day out. Her bedroom was literally on the other side of the Washington's bedroom. She knew everything about them and Martha in particular. And for someone who's the first president, who's about to leave office, who's very sort of thoughtful about image making, about what his legacy would be, in many ways, Ona was a threat to that because she could tell her story, right? And, and people would listen. And eventually she does. It's just many, many years later. Um, so I think it's a combination of Martha wanting her back, of anger, and of the feeling of needing to control one's human property, that he's the president of the United States. How could he not control this one young woman? Uh, yes, sir. So. So the question was, um, that's a, a good question. So was the, the question was about Ona's decision to escape. Was it a culmination of events, or was it this kind of one event, the fact that she's going to be given away, um, that triggered uh, her escape? And I, I argue that it was, it's a combination of things. It's living for six years in Philadelphia, where you see black freedom around you at all times, right? How could that not affect you? She's going to the theater. She's going to the market. She's going to the circus. She's experiencing a very different kind of life at a moment where she is coming of age. So certainly that affects her worldview. She sees black men and women being paid for their labor, yet she is not. But still the question is, you know, what... She's still in Philadelphia six years. She doesn't run away after year one or year two, right? She waits. 
And it is, I think it's the culmination of all, of, of seeing, of, of thinking about the potential of freedom and seeing it in front of her and then also meeting with the knowledge that she's going to be given away to a woman that she doesn't like. Ona says in her interview that she was determined never to be her slave, right? So, you know, enslaved people had the ability to, to figure out like, okay, slavery is horrible, I'm stuck in this situation, but I can figure out who's a really bad slave owner and who I can tolerate, right? Ona was tolerating the Washingtons and did not believe she could tolerate the Washingtons' granddaughter. She pretty much says as much in her interview. So I think it's living in a free Philadelphia and then confronted with this decision that makes her make a choice at a moment where she says, if I went back to Virginia, I knew I would never get my liberty. And so it's these things that come together that prompt, you know, that's sort of what we all, you know, we all have things that we think about or maybe haunt us and maybe we should this, maybe, and then there's that moment where you just have to make a decision. Because if you don't, there will be no more decisions for you to make. Right. Very good. No. Yes, in the back. Yes. That's a great question. So the question was about uh, that it took me nine years to research and write the book. And where did I do a lot of my research? So um, I was all over the place. Um, I spent a lot of time in Virginia libraries. Uh, at the Library of Congress, um, in Philadelphia, at the, li at the Library of Company, as well as at the Histor Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And I also spent time in New England, up in New Hampshire. So um, I think the most special uh, archival trip that I took was actually not to see a document, but towards the end of writing the book, I um, was up in, in New Hampshire and a friend of mine had put me in touch with a local historian who supposedly knew something about Ona's whereabouts when she came up to New England, to New Hampshire. So I, I did kind of one of these weird cold calls, you know, like where you just pick up the phone and call somebody you don't know, which we like never do now because if you don't know someone, you email them because it's just too weird to like pick up, I don't know you, but I'm calling you. Or you text, you know, that's what my son, their people do. Um, and, but I was, you know, old school, and I just picked up the phone. I literally found her number in the phone book. There was a phone book in the hotel, <laughs> and she answered. Um, and so I, you know, I asked her if she'd like to meet, and she said, I told her what I was working on. She said, yeah, I've been working on, I know a lot about this. I actually know where Ona, where the house was that Ona lived in at the end of her life. And I was like, what? Wait, <laughs> you know where this place is? She said, yeah, I know where it is. Um, it's on private property, and uh, this is my a, a friend now. Her name is Vicki Avery, Vicki Pullen. Um, and she said, Let, it's on private property, so I have to get permission for us to go see this home. And we believe that's where her remains are to this day. So I was like, okay, well, that'd be great. And she said, let me make a few calls. I'll call you back. She calls me. She says, meet me. I don't know. It was in this church parking lot. And then we'll go together in my car. Now, mind you, I don't know this lady, right? And I'm from Philly. So I'm all like, well, it's August. It's going to snow here like any moment. If I don't do this now, like I was finishing the book. I felt like I needed to walk in this space that Ona walked in. And I was like... I'm just Ona, just walk with me and keep me safe. So I meet her and her husband and a very large dog. And I'm not a dog fan, at least, I, you know. But this lady, was, I was like, I'm just going to walk in line with this. So we get into her car and she drives it. I don't know what I was thinking, but she was like, I'm going to take you to where we believe, you know, she was, she's interred. So I'm thinking in my, like, 21st century Philadelphia attitude, we're going to a cemetery. And so we pull up, and it's like the woods. And I have on like a skirt and flip flops, you know, like city cute. And I was like, uh, so she gets out of the car and she starts putting on these like big boots. And I'm like, why are you putting those boots on? She's like, oh, all the poison ivy. I'm like, 
<laughs> Great. And so, and she wouldn't let the dog go in the woods with us. I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to get poison ivy. That's just how it's going to be. So we're, and, you know, we're like cutting through the woods and I'm sweating and they're like big dragonfly looking things all over the place. And so we get to the site. The house is no longer standing, but we know where that, where the house stood. And there's one marker for the woman, the, ensla- the free woman, who was enslaved at one point, who owned the house that, that Ona would eventually live in. Six people lived in that home, six black people. And there were, they came in and did some sonar work, and there are six bodies that were found um, underground. And so it was that moment where I wasn't going to see a document or a journal or whatever, but I felt like I needed to see what Ona saw for nearly 50 years, you know, to smell the bay that was nearby, to look at the trees. And she basically lived in the woods in isolation for many, many years. And it was really only at that point that I felt like I was ready to finish the book, you know, that that was like the end of my kind of journey with her doing the research. and so, you know, we leave the woods, and I'm, like, certain I'm going, at any moment, like, poison ivy is going to erupt all over me. <laughs> My husband's a physician. I'm in the car. As soon as I get in the car, you better call something in to CVS because I know something's going to happen right now. And he's like, Erica, do you see any marks? I'm like, no, but it's going to happen. I just walked through the woods in a skirt and flip-flops. It's going to happen. And it never did. I never got poison ivy. And it was one of those moments, I feel like on this journey of writing this book, that Ona's kind of been with me and kind of steered me to the right editor, the right agent, the right publisher, the right just kind of, I, I, and so I, in many ways, I just, I turn it over to her and I let, and I hope, you know, it's my mission that I've done right by her. And I let her just take me where I'm supposed to go. Okay, yeah. The question was about um, how did this person, whose name is Vicky, well, at the time was Vicky Avery, now Vicky Poland, how did she know about Ona? And what's so great, you know, I love local his, amateur historians, you know, who are like in the trenches doing the genealogy work and they're, you know, putting things together. And it was, it was almost a hobby for her. She lived in Portsmouth. She knew about the story, and she was working with a group of other folks, Valerie Cunningham, a well-known historian in the area, who were trying to have the stories of enslaved people represented locally. So it was through, really, a connection, Valerie Cunningham telling me to talk to her and her willingness to be kind to a stranger, to some academic who's writing a book on Ona, and to share with me her information. So, you know, shout out to all the local historians and amateur historians who, who are doing the work too. Yeah. yeah, just as a, you know, just to interject, I mean, the, I think it's really powerful even for students of history. When you're taking a history class, I often challenge my students, you know, uh, if you don't know anything about your family in terms of your parents or your grandparents or your great grandparents, where they came from, what they've gone through, what they've experienced. If you don't know anything, if you don't care about your own history, then how, why would you expect anybody else to care about you mm-hmm. or care about your past? Mm-hmm. So you have to first take ownership and, and appreciate your history and your past and walk those woods because that's where it is. Uh, these unmarked slave cemeteries and unmarked burial grounds are all over the South, all over North Carolina, and all over the South and all mm-hmm. over the country. And you have to walk those mm-hmm. paths sometimes. Mm-hmm. I think we have one question back there. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's a, a very, very quick question. You started your presentation talking about the miniseries roots. And if you were granted that opportunity to turn your book into a miniseries, who would you cast? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so it's important for me for um, Ona's story to make it to different audiences. Um, 
in January, the adapted version of Never Caught will come out for middle grade readers. So that, you know, I feel like it's important for us to have these conversations in colleges and with adults. But if we really want to change a narrative about what Americans think, we have to start with children, right? And that means that historians like myself have to write for teachers. We've got to give them the tools to change a curriculum so that kids who are 8 to 12, middle grade readers who we've written for, um, will have that opportunity. So we start there. And then, of course, the other side of that is the much larger audience. And you, you, know, you said miniseries. Um, so I've optioned the book it to be a feature film. So, um, you know, when you option a... a a book, you know, you're basically selling the rights. So you're selling the rights to producers or to whomever you sell it to um, with the expectation of that team doing a good job in representing her. So, and I feel like I, I hope I picked wisely. I feel like I did. So we have producers, we have a screenwriter. And so I believe, you know, Ona's gonna have her say uh, on, the, <laughs> on the big screen. So I'm excited about that. I'll have uh, I'll have no say on who plays. You know, I when this first all started happening, I was, I was thinking about people, and then I realized like I'm too old to know like the young people these days who would play Ona. Like I'm saying, Carrie Washington, and that's what I said, Carrie Washington. But then they're like, no, she's too old. Like if you if you're really if you focus on who'd you say? Yo, I love her from uh, was on Blackish and now Grownish, right? Um, yeah, if you're listening, uh, you're free. Um, no, I feel like, you know, I, I have no idea, you know, who is sort of young. I'm sure it'll focus a great deal on her as a young adult, like as a teenager, young adult, you know, when she escapes. Um, but I just, you know, I kind of feel like with much of this, I'm turning this, this is Ona. Ona's going to decide who she wants to represent Ona. <laughs> And I think that person, I'm sure that person, uh, will do, will do Ona justice. So read the book first, and then wait for the movie. Everyone, if you join me in thanking, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. And there will be a, oh, I guess we'll think over. No, I was just going to say there will be a book signing, but go ahead. Yeah. Yes, I wanted to thank Dr. Smallwood for moderating yeah. the session, and I'd also like to thank, okay. no, thank you. Dr. Dunbar for sharing with us such a compelling story, and I'd like to say courtesy of Ms. Whitney Hugh and the National Book Foundation, we have complimentary copies of Never Caught for you. And I'm looking to see if someone could raise their hand back there. You see the young lady with her hand raised? Uh, if you line up over there, we can get copies of the book for you, and uh, Dr. Dunbar will autograph them. We also have copies, even though the author could not come, the Firebrand and the First Lady. If you would like a copy of that book, you're welcome to that, too. So thank you so much for coming out. Mm -hmm. Oh, one more thing. If you park.